And so this morning, we are into our next habit. This is number eight in the series, and it's called Listen Before Speaking. Listen before speaking. My daddy used to say, son, you have two ears on the side of your head and one mouth. What do you think you ought to be using more? And uh, obviously, I'm, I'm a talker. Um, although my words, when they run out, I, I have to sort of retreat to the cave and refresh and get recharged. Um, and, but I, I know how important it is at 58 years old. I don't think I understood this at 28 when I planted this church. Matter of fact, some of the things that I'll be sharing this morning were early mistakes that I made and just having to learn through the principle of experience. Hope shared something so powerful last Sunday, and that is the difference between wisdom and experience is that wisdom teaches me on the front end, and the front end is where the cost is. Experience teaches me on the back end of having gone through something and failing, and then the cost is on the back end, obviously. And so I want to be a man of wisdom. I want to be a leader that is filled with the wisdom of God, that is not man's wisdom, but that is God's wisdom. And so I've learned the importance, especially when it comes to doing a little bit of counseling in any kind of area. Um, it, it, it took me a few years to realize that I was not a certified counselor, marriage, or behavioral therapist or anything, but that I really should, shouldn't go beyond about two sessions with anybody in terms of um, biblical counseling regarding a specific problem. Uh, that I can give you the biblical concepts that are there that will speak to you, the tools that you can be, begin to use, and you can pray and seek the Lord. But beyond that, I got to the place where I was no longer ashamed to say, look, this is over my head. Let me recommend you to someone that can really speak to, that's trained in this area, and that can help you to accomplish what you're wanting to fix. Um, I think one of the most critical things that I learned in some of my early experiences and failures was not jumping to conclusions too quickly because there are always two sides to every story. The biggest mistake that you can make is when you hear something from a friend that you immediately get defensive and jump to their side without hearing if it's a couple with a marital problem and you girls are hanging out together and you hear what she has to say. You've got to realize you're only hearing half the truth and it's probably told in such a way that it's going to make your sister look the, in the best light. And the same thing with the guys. You're hanging with your brother, your buddy, or whatever, and you hear the problems that he's having with his wife at home. Be careful not to jump to a conclusion because there's always her side. And as I grew in maturity and leadership, I realized that there was always two sides, and the truth was somewhere in the middle. And the truth was this third option. And so this morning, I want you to recognize the importance of a very necessary habit as we grow in Christ, and that is that we learn to listen before we speak. Say this with me. Listen before speaking. The text is found in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 13, and it says it. Read it with me, please. One verse. He who answers before listening, it is a folly and a shame unto him. It's a shame. It's a shameful thing. It's a folly, and it means it's foolishness. It is going to accomplish nothing, and it will waste time. It's vanity. There are other translations that I want to take a moment and just get it to you because they bring it, I think, in, a, in even a more uh, clear light. The reason I started with this one is it was because it used the word listening. He who answers before listening. Everybody say listening. It is a folly to him and a shame unto him. The contemporary English version says, it's stupid and embarrassing to give an answer before you listen. The English Standard Version, the ESV says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. The Good News Bible says, listen before you answer. If you don't, you're being stupid and insulting. The, the New Century Version says it this way, anyone who answers without listening is foolish and confused. Everybody say confused. New Living Translation, NLT, I love this one. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. You guys getting a clear idea of what we're talking about this morning? And my favorite one is the one I've saved for last, the message. The message says, answering before listening is both stupid and rude. Everybody say stupid and rude. 
don't be stupid and rude. One thing that I want to bring to you this morning is very simply, what I hear determines what I say. Look at your neighbor and tell him right now, what you hear determines what you say. Now, I want you to recognize that uh, before we get into this this morning, uh, I was about to launch into something and I just reminded I need to pray. So let's bow our hearts together. Holy Spirit, we just ask you this morning to help us tune our ears to be listening ears. James 1 says, let us be slow to speak, quick to hear, slow to wrath, slow to anger. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Let us be swift to hear and slow to speak, O God, and slow to anger. Help us this morning to focus our attention and to listen, to not just hear in the sense of our auditory nerves working. Lord, let us pay attention. We ask you today, Holy Spirit, that you move in our hearts. I acknowledge before you and this people that I desperately need you. I need you more than I've ever needed you before. And I ask you today to move in this service, teach open hearts, challenge us, O oh God, correct us, comfort us, Lord, where we need comfort. I pray the strength of the Holy Spirit to be upon us. We'll be careful to give you all the praise, for it is to your honor and your glory that we speak these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. What I hear determines what I say. Um, in the book, Dr. Covey says there are five levels of listening. The first one is ignoring. When the game's on, ladies, this is the option that your husband usually takes. Um, now, sometimes he might move up beyond that, or maybe you're involved in something and not necessarily hearing. We hear all the time, but we're not focused in, and so... Sometimes we're intentionally ignoring because we're trying to focus on something else. The second level of hearing, he, he says in the book, is pretending to hear. This is what we do sometimes when a child is talking and we are preoccupied with something else. We pretend like, mm-hmm, yeah, that's, that's wonderful, and we're not hearing a thing that he or she's saying. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Maybe y'all have never done that. Maybe I'm just confessing my own sin this morning. But this is what we do. We, first one is ignoring. Second one is pretending to hear. The third one is actually moving into probably what the ladies would label us as men having most of the time. Everybody say selective hearing, where we kind of choose uh, what we want to hear. I don't know that that's legitimate or not. The ladies claim that it is, and there may be some truth to that. But we don't want to just pick and choose. We want to be very cognizant of all that has been said, what's going on. We move from that to where the, level, the fourth level where we start to have real success, and that is attentive listening, where we're actually paying attention and we're engaging people that we're sitting down in conversation with over a cup of coffee. We're looking them in the eye. Um, but there's a level that is above level four of attentive hearing, and that's what we want to talk about this morning. It's called empathic communication. Now, that's a strange, probably $10 word. But as we get to this this morning, we're going to be talking about the law of empathy. Everybody say empathy. Empathic hearing or empathic communication is where we listen closely enough that we put ourselves into the shoes of the people or the individual that's talking and we make an attempt to not only understand what they're saying but feel what they're feeling. What has this done to my friend? What has this produced in his life, uh, how has this affected her life, the one that you're talking to? You're not only paying attention to the words that are being said, if she asks you what you just said or if he asks you to repeat the words that he had just used, you would be able to say them back to him or her. But empathic communication is when you actually begin to communicate on a soul-to-soul -soul basis. You, you're actually touching the soul of the other person and you start to feel what they're feeling. The difference between sympathy, which is a commonly used term, and empathy, many times there's confusion between these two. And sympathy is different from empathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for someone because what they're going through. That's what I feel when I hear their circumstances. Empathy is something entirely different. It's when I'm able to listen closely enough and open my heart and become vulnerable myself to let them influence me so that I can begin to feel the struggle that they're going through. 
Uh, and this is a biblical thing. Jesus tells us in the Gospels that we are to mourn with those who mourn. We're to rejoice with those who rejoice. We're to laugh with those who laugh, cry with those who cry. It's something that I think we've lost the ability to sit down in our rat race world and not just pay attention to what people are saying, but actually begin to feel their struggles. The Bible says that we have a high priest who is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus knows what we are going through. Somebody say amen. And so we want to uh, grow in our communication, and I believe this is a true statement, communication is the most important skill for you to develop and have. If you're going to be successful in anything, you need to be able to get your point across. It needs to be clearly stated. You need to be able to give the... Uh, 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 clear understanding of what's going on. But, notice I just said you need to be able to give the clear understanding. This is where we mess up in our current society and where we mess up as human beings. And that is because we seek to be understood first instead of understanding our friend or the one who is, has the problem. So this is, the, this is the, the habit that I want you to see that we're attempting to develop. Say it with me. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Say it with me. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. So when you're listening to someone, when you're, when you're letting them tell you the struggle that they're facing, it's critical that you let them finish their, their thought you let them finish their statement that you don't jump to a conclusion and answer or try to fix a problem. I don't like to read to people because I think to some degree it insults your intelligence, but this is one quick paragraph that I think is worthy of taking your time. This is in the, print, the chapter called Principles of Empathic Communication, and he says this. This is a, a, a little vignette that takes place between a mother and a son. Come on, honey, tell me how you feel. I know it's hard, but I'll try to understand, Mom says. Oh, I don't know, Mom. You'd think it was stupid. Of course I wouldn't. You can tell me. Honey, no one cares for you as much as I do. I'm only interested in your welfare. What's making you so unhappy? Oh, I don't know. Come on, honey. What is it? Well, to tell you the truth, I just don't like school anymore. What? You respond incredulously. What do you mean you don't like school? After all the sacrifices we've made for your education, education is the foundation of your future. If you'd apply yourself like your older sister does, you'd be better and then you'd like school. Time and time again, we've told you to settle down. You've, you've got the ability, but you don't apply yourself. Try harder. Get a positive attitude about it. Pause. Now go ahead and tell me how you feel. I just want to tell you, I did that as a parent. I did that. I don't, don't, you don't have, need a show of hands, but we've all done that as husbands and wives. We've done that as friends. We've done that as parents with our, teach, with our children. And, and obviously, what was taking place was the parent was trying to get her understanding across to their child without trying to understand what was going on in the child's heart. Because the child was actually saying one thing, but the meaning was much deeper. We all do that at times until we feel like there's an unconditional environment of love and acceptance where we know that we will be heard and not condemned, okay? Now, I, I, my first point this morning is very simply this. It is the secret of becoming effective in our relationships. How many of you want that secret this morning? If, if we're going to accomplish anything for the kingdom of God, we're going to have to develop this skill. Communication is the most critically needed and the most powerful skill that you need and you need to develop in your life as an individual, as a Christian, as a husband, a wife, as a parent, as a business owner, as a community leader. Anything that you do where there's an area of influencing people, we need to develop this ability to be effective in our relationships. Before I get into that, I want to ask an important question. Why isn't the church more effective? When I talk about the church, I'm not just talking about Victory Church. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ in the United States of America. Why isn't the church more effective in being able to reach the culture in which we live in the 21st century. It is obviously not. Well, why not? 
because we've been ineffective in communicating Christ to an unbelieving world. We have been ineffective in communicating Christ to an unbelieving world. And I believe that this springs out of a lack of our own individual public victory in our own interpersonal relationships. We have problems in our own families because we've not yet grasped the importance of some of these simple principles and habits that can change our family lives. We need to recognize a primary need. We need to understand that people want to be understood and to be affirmed. People have a desperate need to feel a place, a safe place. That's the reason that I will regularly throw something out that has a little bit of an edge to it, trying to, 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 to uh, sort of ferret out those with pharisaical tendencies because I want to get you healed from that because this has to be a church that is built on grace-based relationships. Nobody is moving from a place of divinity around here except the one who built his church and his name is Jesus. Come on, somebody. We say this regularly. This is not an excuse to stay in the problem we're dealing with, but it's, an, it's a, an awareness that nobody in the room is moving from a place of perfection. Therefore, nobody has a right to get their holier-than-thou long nose looking down at somebody else's struggle that they're in the middle of. Can I get a real hearty amen right here? We want to be people of grace-based relationships. We want to be so ready with the love of God, knowing that we have been immersed in personal forgiveness, that we are ready to be messengers of reconciliation and sharers of the forgiveness of God, no matter what walks through those doors, whether it is a drug dealer or a pimp, a prostitute, a white-collar crime person who's extorting hundreds of thousands of dollars at the local bank and they hadn't found it out yet. Well, no matter what your crime or your sin or your issue is, this is a place where we will throw our arms around you and tell you that Jesus loves you just like you are, but he loves you too much to leave you where you are. Somebody say amen. Now, I'm preaching real good this morning. I'm not in a shout, but there's still some good stuff happening here. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We have a big problem, and that is that we begin relationships seeking to be understood first rather than to understand. We talk before we've listened. We speak before we've heard. We talk first. And when we do listen, we don't listen to understand. We listen with the intent of what we're going to say when they, when they, when they shut up. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You're sitting there, and, and you're not really trying to enter into the struggle that your brother or sister have, but you're already arming yourself with a scripture that's going to put this mess down and fix them and straighten it out and get them fixed. You're not listening to understand, but we listen. Sometimes I catch myself, I'm not listening to grab hold of what's going on in the struggle in, in my brother's and sister's life, but I'm already trying to figure out how I'm going to fix it. I remember one time Dawn stopped me and she said, I know what you're about to do. Just, just hold it. Just zip your mouth. I don't need you to fix it. I just want you to listen to me. And it just stopped me in my tracks and I said, okay, I can do that. Go ahead. Yes. Mm-hmm. And she nodded my head. And really, when I let her finish, then I was able to have a whole different perspective that I wouldn't have had had I gone back and forth interrupting, cutting people off. We interrupt and we communicate to them. When we do that, that we really don't care. We care more about being right or showing somebody our Bible knowledge or giving them a piece of our wisdom or, or hey, I've got good advice. If you would just do this. And you know what? There's a time to do that. But when you try to cut people off before they even get their story told, before you even really figure out what's going on, the most good intention, well-intentioned advice is worthless if it's not speaking to the real problem. Come on, come on somebody, say amen. Dale Carnegie. There's a name we haven't heard in a long time. He was an old dude when I was a kid growing up. With How to Win Friends and Influence People, Dale Carnegie said this. He said, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in other people than you can in two years of trying to get people interested in you. Are you hearing that? If, 
if we will just learn to ask questions and then be quiet to let people answer and let them share with us what's going on in their lives because we all like to talk about ourselves. We all like to talk about what's going on and what's happening with our children and what's happening at our jobs. And if you can learn to ask just a couple of really good questions and then really listen and engage, you can build relationships. If, if, you, have, if you have a little bit of social anxiety and, and, and difficulty being around people, the greatest skill that you can acquire is just to observe a little bit and learn to ask a couple of key questions. Because when you get people talking, then it's like things just sort of become socially lubricated a little bit and it becomes easy and you enjoy being around each other. And that's what we want people to feel when they come in here into this place. They, we want them to feel the grace and the love and the mercy and the goodness of God. They have to feel love first before we open the scripture and say, now, this is where what the word says. Too many times we want to beat them over the head with the word when they hadn't even felt loved yet. Come on, help me. Are you hearing me? The secret to influencing others is to be influenceable by them. To listen long enough so that their heart connects with yours and you can feel the same thing Jesus did. He was touched by the feelings of our infirmities. We want to develop a sincere desire to understand first. And let me just say this. When you're in a conversation with somebody, you don't have to fix them every time. Look at your neighbor and say, we don't have to fix them. In the church, we've seen a little bit of religious abuse. The world is absent from the church, not because they love sin so much, because they don't think we care. They don't think we care about the real problems they have. They think we're tied up in a bunch of religiosity and churchiness. And if they ever do come near to us, then we feel compelled to interrupt and we immediately project our own experience on them. When we don't give others time and space to freely communicate their heart to us in an atmosphere of unconditional acceptance, we are virtually prescribing without a diagnosis. Come on up here and help me, Pastor Jeremy. How you doing? Looking sharp this morning. Isn't this, isn't this a good-looking dude, I'm well, telling you? Well, good-looking good staff. Amen. You know, let's just pretend, let's pretend for a moment that he is a patient and I'm an optometrist. And he comes to my office, and he's interested in correcting a problem with his sight. Take your glasses yeah, off. Yeah, these glasses, they're, they're, they don't work. They're not working? New, What's the problem? Pr it just, I, I can tell I'm not seeing clearly. I need something uh, new. So you need some help? I need, need some need help. That's you know right. What? I don't think we even have to do that. I've had this pair for 10 years, okay. and they are so good. I tell you what, I've got an extra wow. pair. Why don't you take this pair? And, and Pastor? How's that Pastor, work? we're... What's How you matter? doing, Pastor? Isn't that, isn't that, aren't oh, they great? You're fantastic. Uh, see if wow. you would just do this, it would work for you. Wow. Goodness. I'm saying things I hadn't seen in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> now, you need to try harder. Yeah, try harder. Okay. <laughs> Praise God. Is, is it working? Positively. They're great, aren't they? Positively not. Oh, no, you need to be more positive. <laughs> what? No, I can positively not see. That's, that's for sure. Well, goodness. <laughs> All right, let's give him a hand. Now... Thank you, Pastor Jeremy. Now, how many of you recognize how totally foolish that is? But that's what we do with people when we want to put our experience onto them when we haven't even listened to see what they're struggling with. Here, look at the world through my viewpoint, and the problem is you need to stop long enough to look at the world through their viewpoint. You need to see what they're truly struggling with. Come on. This is true of our parent-child, our wife-husband, our friend-friend relationships. What is our one thing? What I hear determines what I say. And too often, I don't hear enough in order to really speak to the real problem. And it's like going to the doctor who gets out his prescription pad and he says, oh, you're not feeling good. And he immediately writes you a script and he says, you know, come back in two weeks. And you go, wait a minute, I didn't even tell you what was wrong. And they prescribe before they diagnose. They speak before they've listened. What I hear determines what I say. Num point number two, we need to listen to understand. Everybody say, listen to understand. Why? As you just saw, when the diagnosis is wrong, the prognosis is bad. If I don't properly diagnose the circumstance, the problem that my child is having, and I cut them off, and I immediately start reading my autobiography to them, 
The kids are not interested in, in, in learning how many miles we had to trudge through snow without boots uphill both ways. How many of you know, they immediately shut us off. They immediately go, okay, here we go. This is dad's autobiography again. I've heard this a thousand times. Why, you ought to be more grateful. All that I've done for you. I'm working two jobs. And you're going, I'm, I just failed a test today, and I can't tell my dad because he won't sh be quiet long enough. I started to say shut up, and I think that's not a good term to use. But too often, we are so quick to try to make them understand. It's like one guy said one time, you know, I just can't, I can't get my kid to understand me, and, and he won't listen. And, and Stephen Covey says, do you hear what you just said? I can't get my kid to understand me. He won't listen. And the problem was the dad wasn't listening to the son because we need to be able to get understanding ourselves with where our friends are, with our brothers and sisters. We lose our ability to influence others when, number one, we don't listen. When we don't listen, there is no acceptance there. Number two, when we condemn. This is the part of judge, judging that the world is screaming at us, the most misused, misinterpreted verse in the whole Bible. We, we, we don't want to be judgmental. We don't want to be condemning or casting down, looking down at people with a holier-than-thou spirit or mentality. People, we lose our ability to influence others when we offer quick-fix solutions. If you just do this, everything will be fine. No, you don't even know what I'm going through. We're not listening before we speak. We lose our ability to influence others when we present a wrong idea of real Christianity. We lose our ability to influence others when we imply that those who are struggling are spiritually de deficient. People in this room right now are struggling. It doesn't mean that you are less than and you're not a good enough Christian. It means you're just, you have a life and you're breathing and you're on the planet and you have problems and in the middle of those problems, God has entrusted his word to you and his wisdom and hopefully relationships with at least one or two people that will listen to you and stand with you in faith. Somebody say amen. We lose our ability to influence others when we participate in practices or tolerate an atmosphere that promotes hypocrisy or glib super superficiality. So many churches are really more like country clubs that everybody just sort of puts on a nice face and shows up and there's nothing of any real substance that is ever spoken to, but it's just very surface. And that's not real walking with Jesus. Somebody say amen. Finally, when we tolerate prejudice of any kind, when we, when we allow prejudice, prejudgment, jumping to conclusions of people based on skin color or based on even lifestyle choices. I don't think anybody ever should be bullied or mistreated or hurt because of something that you and I consider to be a sin. We should love them first before any of that is ever even spoken to. Come on, somebody. We need to listen with a sincere desire to understand, recognizing that only 10% of our communication is our words. 30% of it is auditory, what we're hearing people say, but 60% of it is our body language. You know, when you're in the presence of someone, do you look at them when you're talking to them? Do you honor them by looking them in the eye and, and not just sort of looking off somewhere else? It's important that you engage and you pay attention. One thing, what I hear determines what I say. Finally, this morning, I'm finished. This is my third principle in this. We've talked about the secret to developing effective relationships. We've talked about listening to understand. This is the reason why you, when you go into a courtroom that we have someone present testimony, but then there is a cross-examination by the other side so that questions can be asked so that the truth can come out with a little different light. It's like a diamond laid on a piece of black velvet in a jewelry store and the bright light is shining down and the jeweler or the gemologist will hold it up and literally you can see all of the facets. Truth is like that. You can see it from different perspectives or different sides. Anytime you're dealing with a relationship, you're dealing with a diamond, something that's valuable. And we must recognize that we come to this with different perspectives, different experiences, a different worldview than the other person that's involved. And we will never be able to connect to them on any kind of an intimate friendship or husband, wife, or parent-child basis if we don't learn this amazing habit of listening before we speak. Somebody say amen. 
I want to give you three proofs this morning quickly that Jesus followed and practiced this same habit. This is the Christ example. Are you getting anything out of this this morning? Remember, what I hear determines what I say. First of all, Jesus saw each person as unique. Everybody say unique. That's very simply one of a kind. We are like the snowflakes, which God paid almost to a ridiculous degree attention to uniqueness in every one of them. The DNA code that makes up every person sitting in this room this morning is unique to you. Uh, when you marry and you parent a child, it's the blending of those two, and that child has unique DNA. So there's a destiny, there's a calling that is on every one of us that is unique to who we are. And when you see Jesus meet people with difficulties, he never treated two people the exact same way. To the rich young ruler who was proud, Jesus began to talk to him about the commandments of God because he knew that he wasn't ready yet to receive grace in the sense of acceptance. He needed to be broken because he'd made an idol out of his riches. Well, you've kept the commandments? Okay, great. Then go take everything you have. What you don't realize in your heart is you've made your money an idol. Go give everything away and then come back and follow me. And the young ruler left with a fallen countenance. The, 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 the common translations say sad, but the Greek says mad. He was ticked off because Jesus touched where his little G God was. Now, so why didn't Jesus just treat everybody the same way? The woman caught in, the, in adultery, caught in the act. He didn't take the law out and try to break her. She was already broken. She was in a place of desperation. Evil men, religious, pharisaical men, that were probably some of their buddies were involved with her. They didn't bring them in when they brought the woman caught. If they were caught, there was a man there too. Come on, are you with me? But they didn't bring, the, they didn't bring their buddy they brought just the sister and they dropped her at the feet of Jesus and Jesus very simply not dealing with her. He deals with all them first. He says, okay, all you guys, any of you that are out here without any sin whatsoever, pick up your bag of rocks and you throw the first stone. And the scripture says they all one by one dropped their rocks and walked away. And Jesus looks at her and he says, woman, where are your accusers? Jesus, this is my next point, he asks questions. He knew where their accusers were. They were gone. But he wanted her to acknowledge where their accusers were. So he doesn't treat everybody the same. It, we, we, we are captivated in an American idea of fairness. And the kingdom of God is not fair. God is not fair. God is completely just and he is righteous, but he is not fair in the American sense. Why? Because he doesn't treat everybody exactly the same because everybody in the room is not exactly the same. Shay's circumstances are not the same as Jeremy's, which are not the same as Brenna's, which are not the same as Susan or Buddy's. Every one of us in here are going through different circumstances, and the Lord knows how to tailor make, custom design an answer for you. Therefore, we as brothers and sisters to one another need to learn how to mourn with our brothers that are mourning and rejoice with our sisters that are rejoicing. I've never, ever been a jealous person. Somebody gets a new car and they drive by the house and show me. Man, I'm excited for you. Praise God. You know what? I expect you to be excited when I get my new one too. Hallelujah. Folk aren't always that way. People are grieving. They don't need me to feel sorry for them. They need me to feel what they're feeling. Are you hearing me this morning? And you can't do that if you speak before you listen. Jesus asked questions to the blind man. What do you want? To Peter, do you love me? To Judas, do you betray the Son of Man? Remember in John 2, 23, it says Jesus knows what's in the heart of every man. He already knows what you're thinking. He knows your intentions, your motivations. He knows the thoughts and the desires of your heart, but yet he still asks you a question. Because he wants to draw you out and help you realize that he feels what you're feeling. Get this, Jesus listened for 30 years before he started his ministry of speaking. He heard the voice of the Father. He heard the parental teaching of his parents. He learned the discipline in the carpenter shop with his, with his earthly father, Joseph. Jesus exampled all of this for us. He gives us an example of an effective life that truly communicated God's love and righteous judgment in interpersonal relationships. 
No other habit can revolutionize our interpersonal relationships like this one. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. What is our one thing? Say it with me. What I hear determines what I say. What I hear determines what I say. Sydney, honey, you're right on time. I don't know who sent you, but that's perfect. Let's bow.